DC Police Chief Peter Newsham watches an eight minute long cell phone video showing some questionable tactics by DC police officers. It was part of an emotional public hearing today where council members grilled the chief about stop and frisk tactics. We have a violent crime problem, particularly in Ward 7 and 8. It's about rather than coming up in an unmarked car and jumping out onto the sidewalk and frisking everybody, it's about pulling up a chair and sitting down with folks for a few hours and understanding who they are and what their struggles are. Eric Flack is standing by in Deanwood, where a public hearing is about to get underway. But we begin with Delia Gonsalves at the Wilson Building, where Chief Newsom responded to her reporting about one of those questionable searches. Delia, good evening. Good evening, Adam. The chief was grilled for more than three hours by members of the city council, faced some tough questions, and then stood for a news conference with us, where we received some more tough questions and, as you said, spoke directly about the exclusive information we gave you yesterday and that backyard search, that cell phone video we will show you in just moments. He faced very tough questions, including from Vince Gray, who represents the ward where the Price family live and where that search took place. You know, we have seen a couple of videos that you have highlighted. The chief is talking about the cell phone video we showed you last night at 11, showing officers Whitehead and Gupton searching this northeast backyard. No warrant, no announcement, no explanation. And this is not just any home. This is where Jeffrey Price lived with his mother. Hey, sir, I, don't want, I don't want you on my property. It's the 22 year old who was killed when his illegal dirt bike collided with a cruiser in early May. This search happened days after his death. Today, Councilmember Vince Gray of Ward 7 takes the chief to task about that search. A police spokesperson telling us that officers were following a tip that someone dumped a gun in the area. I, I felt very uncomfortable with the video that I saw, and I have to say up front. You should have been, you should have been angry. I was, and, and I got to tell you that we don't uh, believe that the officers had any knowledge that it involved that that search of that property involved the Price family, but that doesn't excuse. That, that doesn't excuse. Yeah. Them saying, where could he answer the question? Why they were there? The lack of communication. I agree. I the officers are out of the GRU, but back on the street. I'm told back in six and seven D, which puts mm, them. I don't know what districts they're in. You are. But it, they are six. Okay. It puts them in the community that felt. Yeah. They were violent. And and the Does thing is, well. It, you know, one of the things that we have to deal with is we have uh, our employees that are, were allegedly involved in misconduct. We have seen the video and we can all draw assumptions from that. We're going to conduct an investigation. If we're able to sustain the misconduct uh, that most of us are assuming occurred in that video, uh, then they will be dealt with. The chief says they're in a tough spot trying to address the needs of the community who want police in their area to stop the drug dealing. Of course, though, balancing that with uh, not violating people's constitutional rights. He says it's a delicate balance. They're trying their very best, and he says he is committed to holding these officers accountable. However, he says these videos, as inflammatory as they are, are simply snapshots of some possible misconduct and does not represent all of MPD. The Price family, they are filing suit, filing a complaint with the ACLU about that search of their backyard. We're live at the Wilson Building, Delia Gonsalves, WUSA 9. And we'll now just wait and see if any of these discussions today actually initiate change. Delia, thank you. That hearing was the first of two today. A second one is going on right now in one of the communities most impacted by this. Investigative reporter Eric Flack is live at the Deanwood Recreation Center. And Eric, what's the turnout like there? Leslie, it's going to be a big turnout. People are just now filing in. That morning hearing you referenced actually went so long that everybody's a little bit late making it across town to this part of the city to actually get this thing going. Once they do get it going, they expect a passionate crowd. A number of people in this community have signed up to speak. The one group that is not invited tonight is the D.C. Police Department. The council member, Charles Allen, who arranged all this, as well as many community groups like the ACLU, D.C have specifically asked the police department and specifically police chief Peter Newsham to stay away because they want people to be able to feel like they can speak freely and the police chief has agreed to do that. Many of the people here will be sharing their personal stories and advocating for change 
about the way the D.C. Police Department polices this community and others in Ward 7 and 8. And those stories are very similar to the ones we have been reporting on in our stop and frisk reporting that dates back a year now. These images, a window into the anger and outrage some people in the Deanwood community have towards D.C. police and the force with which those same officers are pushing back, all brought on by the release of that now infamous cell phone video recorded in the exact same spot June 13th of a stop and frisk of young black men, many here called unconstitutional. WUSA 9 first brought videos like that to light as part of our year long investigation, DC police stop and frisk. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold you stuck your finger like. Our investigation revealed eight out of ten people stopped and frisked by D.C. police are black, even though African Americans make up less than half the city's population, and that those stops can be indiscriminate, often based on vague descriptions of young African American men and women. This is my license. I'm a pharmacist, right? But I get stopped all the and because of that, I have to show this. It was the stories of people like pharmacist Alexander Oladell that bothered us most. Two white cars, they come up to me and they uh, they put me in handcuffs and I'm over the dashboard like this. And the whole time I was, I was, I don't know why I did this, but I was literally pleading my case. Oh, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a pharmacist student, I didn't do anything. But that didn't, they didn't really care. We found the D.C. Police Department had failed to follow a critical part of a two-year-old law known as the NEAR Act, designed to better track stop and frisk in the district to protect against racial bias by police officers. After our report, the ACLU D.C., Black Lives Matter D.C., and Stop Police Terror Project D.C. filed a lawsuit against Police Chief Peter Newsham, Mayor Mariel Bowser, and Deputy Mayor for Public Safety Kevin Donahue to hold the city accountable. Hi, Chief Newsham. Hi, hi, sir. What's your name? Uh, Eric Flack, okay. WUSA. Chief Newsham wasn't interested in talking about stop and frisk with us. But we can't work with you. I'm sorry. Okay, can you just tell me if this video I think is inappropriate? I think well, I disagree with everything you said, but what I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. But less than two months after our first report aired, Newsham admitted to D.C. Council the police department was in fact guilty of failing to follow that law requiring it to better track stop and frisk by its officers. To the extent there has been a delay in this data piece and not a, a complete understanding of the, uh, the necessary infrastructure changes that would be required, uh, we're guilty. D.C. Council has now funded a half million dollar plan to finally collect comprehensive stop and frisk data. But that system won't be up and running until next summer, meaning incidents like that stop and frisk in front of Nook's Barbershop still are not getting the comprehensive review required under the NEAR Act. Go that way, go that way. Leaving tensions between police and some parts of our community at a breaking point. And that's really what these hearings are about. It's trying to give people a chance to share their personal experience and possibly even press police to try and find a different way to work with this community so we stop having ugly scenes like the ones that we've seen in those cell phone videos. If you are not signed up to speak, you can come down here still and sign up. It's going to get started fairly soon. It's a hard out at 8.30. You do not have to give your name. Cameras will be turned away from any speaker who does not want their identity shown. This is supposed to be a safe place for this people for people in this community to share their experiences with police. Reporting live from the Deanwood Recreation Center, Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Of course, many will leave there wanting to know if they are going to be treated differently starting today. That's a clear, uh, a clear question people have uh, questions about and they want answers to. Right now, you can watch a live stream of that public meeting there in the Deanwood Recreation Center on WUSA9.com. You'll also find our entire series of reports on our website. It's called DC Police Stop and Frisk. And we'll have more on DC Police and the community they serve tonight at 7 on Off Script. We are devoting the entire newscast to that topic. Uh right now at 6, a string of cell phone videos have put new pressure on DC Police. In recent weeks, we've shown you a series of questionable police tactics. Police walking uninvited into someone's fenced in backyard and searching. Officers using a gun found in a man's waistband as justification to frisk an entire group. 
and a nighttime confrontation between police and angry members of Northeast DC's Deanwood community. Tonight we've got some new information about officers who are under investigation. DC Police Chief Peter Newsham calls some of their actions disturbing and inappropriate, and the DC City Council is demanding change. Listen to this. In my gut, and I think and the intuition of a lot of people across District of Columbia is that there's got to be more that MPD can do to build and foster a sense of trust. There's got to be better approaches to uh, community policing that could help move us in a positive direction. Policing has a black eye in America, and we are continuing to have a black eye because of these negative interactions that we're seeing nationally, and now we're seeing some of them here in our own community. And so I think what we need to do is, uh, you know, you talked about uh, officer friendly in the side by side band, but before you had a negative impression of the police, we're trying to reinfuse those types of relationships, particularly with our young folks, so that we can have more positive and more trusting relationships. That was the first of two hearings today. It was the newest development following a year long WUSA 9 investigation into the practice of what's called stop and frisk. Investigative reporter Eric Flack is live at the Deanwood Recreation Center where a community meeting is taking place right now. Hey Leslie, you know, earlier today the police chief was grilled for three hours over those questions about police tactics in Ward 7 and 8, but the police chief and the police department not invited to tonight's meeting at the Deanwood Recreation Center. In fact, just the opposite. They were specifically asked to stay away so people here could share and feel like they could speak openly without having police looking over their shoulder. I'm going to step out of the way of the camera and show you just how big this crowd is. A number of people taking turns sharing their own experiences with the same sort of emotion that we saw earlier this morning at the D.C. Council headquarters. We're going to start with one woman who did not want her identity shown, but she certainly had a lot to say. And we're a big community but well, we're fighting against each other trying to get answers but they're defending themselves well who's defending us we have to respect these people where does the responsibility lies in mpd and the government to protect us as citizens not black not yellow not white not pink not orange like seriously what is going on with our mpd we don't pay them to do this we don't pay them to harass law-abiding citizens we don't pay them to assault our young black youth, our young black adults, our brown adults. We don't pay them for this, sir. It has to stop. And what we're seeing here today from the incidents at Deanwood and from the officers doing warrantless searches on houses, the increase in police-involved shootings tells a story of a culture within D.C. that we need to fix before those incidents rise to the occasion where we are the next Ferguson in Baltimore. And that's kind of the concern, I think, from a lot of people in this community. And the reason behind some of these hearings today is many people feel like things are sort of reaching a breaking point between police and the community here in the Deanwood community and also in Ward 7 and 8 generally. Tonight's hearing is supposed to go till about 8.30, but judging by this crowd, could go a lot longer. Reporting live from the Deanwood Recreation Center, Eric Flack, WUSA 9. It's clear something has to change. Let's hope tonight is the start of that. You know, last night we showed you this this video of police searching the backyard of a DC family. This was also caught on cell phone. And today the chief told us those officers have been removed from the special gun recovery unit. Delia Gonsalves brings us that part of the story. The chief made it clear the video we highlighted is just a snapshot of possible police misconduct and does not represent all of the officers of MPD still he faced some tough questions about that search in his three hour testimony before the city council. Me, sir. I, want, I don't want you on my property. That is Jeffrey Price's mother repeatedly asking police to leave her backyard. They searched the property just days after her 22 year old son was killed when his illegal dirt bike collided with a police cruiser in Northeast. I felt very uncomfortable with the video that I saw. Today, Councilmember Vint Gray of Ward 7 takes the chief to task about that search. The officers are out of the GRU, but back on the street, I'm told back in 6 and 7D, which puts mm, them. I don't know what districts they're in. They are. Put it, they are in 6A, okay. It puts them in the community. 
that felt yeah. they were violent. And, and the Does thing is, well, it, you know, one of the things that we have to deal with is we have uh, our employees that are, were allegedly involved in misconduct. We have seen the video and we can all draw assumptions from that. We're going to conduct an investigation. If we're able to sustain the misconduct uh, that most of us are assuming occurred in that video, uh, then they will be dealt with. The Price family, they tell me they're filing a complaint with the ACLU about that search of their backyard. Outside the Wilson Building, Delia Gonsalves, WUSA 9. Right now you can watch a live stream of the community meeting on Stop and Frisk at the Deanwood Recreation Center. It's on WUSA9.com. And then at 7, we'll have much more on D.C. police and the community they serve coming up on a special off script. The entire newscast will be devoted to the topic of Stop and Frisk. One segment of our community, uh, and I spend a lot of time with the folks who live in Ward 8, wants to see more police officers because police officers make them feel safe. I understand I that, to, but what are your no, goals? I mean, is it just to get more guns or that, to, to do no, something no, else? The, the goal, goal is to make people feel safe because our responsibility <laughs> is, first Don't. of all, is to reduce crime, but it's also to make people feel safe. And I can't ignore the folks in the community that want to see police officers. I'm not asking you to ignore anyone. I'm asking what your specific goals are. The, the goal of having more police is to have a police presence to make people feel safer. Glad you're with us on Off Script tonight. I'm Adam Longo in for Bruce Johnson once again. People are demanding change to the way that D.C. police police this city. And today, after a year-long investigation by WUSA 9, D.C. Council holds public hearings about officer tactics, including stop and frisk. We have live coverage of today's emotionally charged hearings. We have a camera at the second meeting of the day being held right now at the Deanwood Community Center. Our investigative reporter Eric Flack is at that meeting. This has been going on now for a couple of hours. Are people pretty fired up there, Eric? Adam, there's a lot of emotions in this room to be sure. It's really a remarkable day in Washington, D.C. when you're talking about the D.C. Police Department sort of on trial, um, answering hard questions this morning from D.C. Council about the way they police um, many uh, segments of this community, specifically Deanwood, where there's been a lot of unrest recently, and Ward 7 and 8 in general. The police chief grilled for the better part of three hours by D.C. Council this morning, tonight, at this meeting at the Deanwood Recreation Center, no police invited. In fact, the chief asked to stay away so people could speak openly and honestly, and that's what they're doing. There are a number of people who have been working to get on the stand to tell council members their personal stories. They are stories that we have reported on for the better part of a year. Let's take a look at how we got here. These images, a window into the anger and outrage some people in the Deanwood community have towards D.C. police and the force with which those same officers are pushing back, all brought on by the release of that now infamous cell phone video recorded in the exact same spot June 13th of a stop and frisk of young black men, many here called unconstitutional. WUSA 9 first brought videos like that to light as part of our year long investigation DC police stop and frisk. Come on, man. Our investigation revealed eight out of 10 people stop and frisk by DC police are black, even though African Americans make up less than half the city's population. And that those stops can be indiscriminate, often based on vague descriptions of young African American men and women. This is my license. I'm a pharmacist, right? But I get stopped all the and because of that, I have to show this. It was the stories of people like pharmacist Alexander Oladell that bothered us most. Two white cars, they come up to me and they uh, they put me in handcuffs and I'm over the dashboard like this. And the whole time I was, I was, I don't know why I did this, but I was literally pleading my case. Oh, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a pharmacist, I didn't do anything. But that didn't, they didn't really care. 
We found the D.C. Police Department had failed to follow a critical part of a two-year-old law known as the NEAR Act, designed to better track stop and frisk in the district to protect against racial bias by police officers. After our report, the ACLU DC, Black Lives Matter DC, and Stop Police Terror Project DC filed a lawsuit against Police Chief Peter Newsham, Mayor Mariel Bowser, and Deputy Mayor for Public Safety Kevin Donahue to hold the city accountable. Hi, Chief Newsham. Hi, hi, sir. What's your name? Uh, Eric Flack, okay. WUSA. Chief Newsham wasn't interested in talking about stop and frisk with us. But we can't work with you. I'm sorry. Okay, can you just tell me if this video is inappropriate? I well, I disagree with everything you said, but what I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. But less than two months after our first report aired, Newsham admitted to D.C. Council the police department was in fact guilty of failing to follow that law requiring it to better track stop and frisk by its officers. To the extent there has been a delay in this data piece and not a, a complete understanding of the, uh, the necessary infrastructure changes that would be required, uh, we're guilty. D.C. Council has now funded a half million dollar plan to finally collect comprehensive stop and frisk data. But that system won't be up and running until next summer, meaning incidents like that stop and frisk in front of Nook's Barbershop still are not getting the comprehensive review required under the NEAR Act. Go that way, go that way. Leaving tensions between police and some parts of our community at a breaking point. Councilmember Charles Allen is the chairman of the D.C. Council Public Safety Committee. He is the person who called for both of today's public hearings on police conduct. I spoke with him just before this meeting began to ask him what he thought about the chief's response this morning. Take a listen. Were you concerned by anything you heard this morning? Well, I thought it was an important conversation. It's a tough conversation. Um, you know, I think there's areas where we need to continue asking, get more answers. Obviously, uh, things around data, things like that were very clearly not exactly where we need them to be, and we got a lot more work in front of us. But I also was concerned that we felt too much where I was hearing MPD talk about what would be legal or permissible, not necessarily what's right. Um, what I mean by that is what's right by the community when we think of what is building trust with community policing. And so I'm going to continue my conversations with the chief, the committee will continue oversight. Uh, but that's definitely an area where I think we have a lot of work to do. Were, the, were you satisfied by Chief Newsham's answers to your questions and the other council members' questions? I think that he answered questions fairly well. Um, there's certainly still some gaps the committee's going to be having oversight around. I, you know, when it and it seems like a lot of questions still to be answered by the council. The question now is, with all these personal stories, what does the council do with those experiences moving forward? Adam, back to you. Yeah, will it lead to change and how long will it take? Because everyone in that room, they want to see action and they want to see it now. We'll be following up, of course. Eric, great job reporting out there with, on this today. Now, as Eric said, the ACLU requested that D.C. Police and Chief Newsham not attend the meeting happening right now. The chief was invited to the morning discussion. D.C. council members grilled the chief about his department's practices. Well, I'm, well, like I said, I'd like to see the other videos. The reality is, though, that they were clearly pushing people around, saying, move along. They were yeah, that, pulling the kid out of, or the young man out of the chair. I think, I think that tension makes us all uncomfortable. And I do think that, you know, like the balance is, uh, and we've talked about it, I think everybody on the dais has mentioned it, uh, that we have a violent crime problem, particularly in Ward 7 and 8. And, and if you don't want, if you want to kind of disagree with that, you're welcome to disagree. But we have 30, Chief, I don't disagree. I, what I, mean, what sir, I disagree I gotta with this because there were well, 30, 38 people that have been murdered since January 1st in Ward 8 in our city. And I am, I am well aware of this. What I'm saying, yeah, that's and real. let me be clear about this, what I'm saying is I don't think that the tactics that you're employing on the streets are actually solving the problem. Well, and, and I don't think taking on the community in this way where you come you're storming into the community and make everybody uncomfortable and not actually sit down and engage in a community conversation. Oh, we and spend, let me, let me that, finish, Chief. That's not a fair characterization because we spend a tremendous amount of time engaging with folks in the community. And we were 100 percent open to changing the way that we operate. And we are going to take a very close look 
at this incident in particular. You can see Chief, all let me, let me just you can see all I understand the people that, that are I, seated behind I, me that are concerned about this incident. We I are understand. equally concerned. Me too. And I, and I really believe that there is an issue that needs to be addressed in this particular incident. But what I'm referring to actually is the sentiment that I hear from, from the youth in our community who say that they don't believe the police are somebody that they can call, that they're afraid to talk to the police, that when they go down the street, they cross the street to avoid the police. So after this morning's meeting, Ardelia Gonsalves talked with Chief Newsham during a press conference. You can see that interview right now on our WSA 9 Facebook page. And we're getting a lot of people weighing in online about today's roundtable discussions. Tabby here says citizens are starting to look at all police as bullies instead of protectors. It's sad. And Jasmine saying, I'm glad this is being talked about. Now it's time to take action. So listen, you can tweet us throughout the program using the hashtag OffscriptOn9. Get involved in the discussion. We'll be sharing your tweets at the end of the show. Many of the incidents that community members are accusing police of are caught on camera, not just by police body cameras, but from cell phone video. Now, this controversial cell phone video taken last month has local community leaders accusing D.C. police of violating people's civil rights by conducting illegal stop and frisk searches. Here's more from Eric Flack. Everyone has a camera these days. We have cell phone cameras. Police have those body worn cameras. So there's no shortage of footage from last night's angry confrontation between dozens of police officers and young African-American men and women on Sheriff Road in Northeast D.C. Now, we've only seen the footage from the cell phones, from the people who were confronting police, going toe to toe with police. And police were not giving an inch. That was Mace in the officer's hand as he tried to back up that crowd, although from the video it is unclear if he actually sprayed it. We also saw batons and even tasers in the hands of those officers as they tried to keep that crowd in control. Yo, y'all can get touched. I don't know why you keep saying that. If he tells you not to come and say you gotta move back, you gotta move back. Tonight, that officer was talking about social media likes, the idea that all those people were just recording those officers trying to incite them to do something so they could post it and go viral. But from what we saw, there was antagonizing kind of on both sides. There were those young people with their camera phones just inches from officers' faces, and a lot of those officers going right back at the crowd. Don't touch me, bro. So how did we get here? Well, remember that cell phone video we showed you last night? It was taken in the exact same location and it surfaced over the weekend. It was of a group of young African-American men being stopped and frisked by a bunch of D.C. police officers who were looking for weapons but didn't find any. The neighborhood commissioner in that area, Lorenzo Green, called those searches completely unconstitutional. And he wrote a letter to D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsham demanding an investigation. I spoke with Green at the scene of this latest incident, and he was pointing the finger squarely at D.C.'s police chief. All these commanders that think they're doing true community policing, they need to go. Newsom need to go. This is not how you respond to a community that's crying out for help. Because that's what that video was about. It was about folks crying out for help. We've been telling the stories of those folks for about a year now. Our ongoing series, DC Police Stop and Frisk, uncovered eight out of 10 people stop and frisk by DC Police are black, and that the police department had not followed a two-year-old law called the NEAR Act that required it to better track stop and frisk data to protect against racial bias. Newsom is not collecting all the data that he's required to collect from the NEAR Act because he don't want them to see the truth. He don't want to see what's happening with these stops. Now, obviously, police have a very difficult job to do. And every time we report one of these stories, we ask them for an interview. We did that in this case, and they turned us down. But out in the chaos last night, I spoke with April Goggins of Black Lives Matter, and she told me the way she sees police 
patrolling her neighborhood is not making anything any safer. All of those things over time erode the dignity of human beings. It doesn't matter what situation. You do that for so long, and when you tell your elected officials and they do nothing, what are you supposed to do? And that's why all this matters so much. It's the everyday people who feel like they are out on the street being stopped and even frisked by police for no other reason other than the fact that they are black. But there are police officers who are looking for solutions as well. Late after everything had calmed down, one of the last things I saw was the last police officer out there, the one actually assigned to that neighborhood, talking with some of the people who were actually on the front lines of all the pushing and shoving with police. What I stayed by, behind to do was to get anyone who was interested in giving their names to make an official complaint. In fact, that ANC commissioner, Lorenzo Green, the one who's been out there fighting for all his people in his neighborhood, he got emotional just talking about what's next. I'm sad about this. Sad. This is the response. This is response for folks speaking out for our people. This is the response. But I'm not afraid of them. They're not afraid of them. You know, and we're gonna we're gonna stand vigilant and we're gonna push back hard and we're gonna keep talking out. We're gonna keep talking and we're gonna keep posting those videos and you know, and we're gonna keep revealing the truth to our people and hope they wake up and realize that when your people speak, you need to listen to them. Now, D.C. police arrested four people out there that night, three for assault on a police officer. No officers were injured. We're back with more from today's community discussion on stop and frisk coming up. We doing on time, Melissa? Okay, got it. Yeah, absolutely. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. you both are talking at the same time. Yes. Melissa. Thank This is a live look at that community discussion on DC police happening right now at the Deanwood Rec Center in Northeast. Now, a passionate crowd from the community has been speaking since five this afternoon. We wanted to hear from one of those people. Eugene Perrier is with the Stop Police Terror Project DC. That group is 
one of those who filed a lawsuit against Chief Newsham, Mayor Bowser, and Deputy Mayor Donahue for failing to collect stop and frisk data. So thanks so much for coming on with us tonight, Eugene. Uh, we've got two issues going on here. The first of which is the collection of the stop and frisk data. The second of which is the police tactics during these stop and frisk incidents. So do you believe the community meeting you're at now and the D.C. Council meeting earlier, do you believe that's progress being made, forward progress? Well, I think it's at least a first step in terms of what forward progress could look like. But I think at the end of the day, what we're really just seeing at these two community meetings is really the airing of issues that for years have been out there and now are starting to sort of creep into the mainstream and get some level of purchase hold with our elected officials. But I think the proof will be in the pudding is, is, is the reality on, on twofold. Are we going to hold the MPD accountable to keep the data they're supposed to keep? And are we going to get serious about making sure that the type of tactics they are using, which are unconstitutional, stop and frisk tactics, which have proved in every single city it's ever been studied to be completely ineffective at its actual goal of uh, lowering crime and getting guns off the street, uh, I think that will be the ultimate proof. But I do think this is a step forward, and I think, honestly, the legitimacy that's being given to the community here, uh, as opposed to the dismissal we normally get, is certainly encouraging. So do you believe people there in Deanwood are going to be treated differently by the police from this day forward? Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I'd like to say that. I think that we also could see retaliation because of this. What I do think is that people in Deanwood are certainly going to continue to speak out and to feel empowered and to make sure that certainly uh, these type of activities don't go without some sort of response. So I'd certainly like to think so, but I think what we've seen so far from the Metropolitan Police is they aren't willing to change. They have to be forced to change, and I think this is the first step of a community standing up and advocating for itself. So, Eugene, one last thing. Do you think the people there feel encouraged by this discussion, the fact that the police chief took all these very pointed questions from city council? I think people are encouraged that finally their voices are being heard and that at least we saw the police chief, he had to, to squirm and to obfuscate and to misrepresent things, which is exactly what we expected. But I think finally he's in the hot seat and I think that's where he deserves to be. And I do think people are encouraged here and I think they're encouraged by each other uh, and standing together and I think it's a great thing to see. Eugene Perrier with us from that community meeting in Deanwood. Appreciate you coming on and chatting with us tonight. That is collected in different ways. All right, we'll be right back. That community meeting on D.C. police, specifically their stop and frisk policies in Ward 7 and 8, has been going on here for two and a half hours. People are still sharing their stories and concerns, and online, people are weighing in as well. Livonia says, all I ever see are young black men loitering outside, being rude and disrespectful. If you don't want to be harassed, then don't put yourself in those situations. And Eric says, when people do wrong, they should be held accountable, point blank, period, just like any other job would. Mary says this goes on a lot. Police cannot break the law and then claim they're enforcing the law just because they wear a badge. We'll be closely monitoring this meeting tonight. We're going to have much more on the news at 11. This is an issue that we have covered extensively with Eric Flack, our investigative reporter, in a series of reports. Uh, anything that you saw tonight, you can also see on our news app and our website, including the press conference today with Chief Newsham and Delia Gonsalves there and Eric to ask him some tough questions. That's it for us on Offscript tonight. As always, you can tweet us your thoughts using the hashtag Offscript on 9. Again, much more, much deeper into this at 11 o'clock tonight. I'm Adam Longo in for Bruce Johnson. We hope you have a great night. We've got major developments to tell you about in our year-long investigation, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. The ACLU District of Columbia has filed a lawsuit against a D.C. Metropolitan Police officer accusing him of violating a man's constitutional rights during a stop and frisk search. It's a story we broke first on the WUSA 9 mobile app. Investigative reporter Eric Flack spoke with the man at the center of a now infamous video showing that incident. This lawsuit comes less than two months after WUSA 9 uncovered cell phone video of the incident. The man in that video telling me tonight he felt humiliated and degraded by that police officer. I'm a very important guy in my community. Very important. They love me. I'm, I'm the ice cream man, you know, so. <laughs>
MB Cunningham means that literally. He says he drove an ice cream truck for years in Southwest DC when he wasn't trying to get his singing career off the ground. But now he's known best for this video of a stop and frisk from September 27th, 2017. Posted to YouTube, seen more than 52,000 times, replayed in Cottingham's mind over and over again. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold, you he don't stuck got nothing on him. He don't got nothing on him. He all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my cat, man. Don't do that, man. Nah, he don't got nothing. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him. I don't have nothing. The 39-year-old father of three talking about it publicly for the first time. He knew that he was violating me. He knew it. He had to. The day wasn't supposed to go this way. It was Cottingham's birthday. He says he stopped to have a drink with a group of friends on a sidewalk of his Southwest DC neighborhood when a group of police officers rolled by and noticed the open container of alcohol. Officers pulled up as they normally do in my community. You know, you have any guns on you? No, sir. Everyone almost simultaneously said no at the same time. That's when this officer, identified in the lawsuit as Sean Logicono, spotted a small amount of marijuana in Cottingham's sock. The pot was within the legal limits in the district, so Cottingham says he offered to let Officer Logicono pat him down for weapons. The lawsuit says Cottingham called it doing the hokey pokey because you turn yourself around. But Cottingham did not get the light pat down he expected. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him. He all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my cat, man. Don't do that, man. Nah, he don't got nothing. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him. I don't have nothing. The lawsuit says Officer Logicono jammed his fingers between Mr. Cottingham's buttocks and grabbed his genitals, which could be acceptable if this was a drug search, but since small amounts of pot are legal in D.C., the officer doesn't appear to have probable cause for that more invasive drug search. Yet the officer continues, despite Cottingham's continued protests about where he's putting his hands. He again goes back in after he stopped. Same area that I just told you I was uncomfortable. Now, I don't know what you think you're going to, you're not going to pull a rabbit out of a hat, so to speak. The officer did not find any illegal drugs or weapons, and Cottingham was eventually released. D.C. police told us they won't comment on pending litigation, but last week, Police Chief Peter Newsham told D.C. Council after reviewing the video, it looked like it was inappropriate touching by the officer, and that Logicono had been disciplined but was still on active duty with the police department. The ACLU, which filed the lawsuit on Cottingham's behalf, says that isn't good enough. When off an officer misbehaves this badly, the consequences should be severe. You think the officer should be fired? I do. I mean, obviously, that's not a decision that's, that's up to me, and that's not something we can ask the court to order. But I think if the chief is serious about policing in a constitutional and respectful manner, the types of actions we saw in that video have no place in the District of Columbia. The officers are supposed to be there to protect and serve. They took a note. They have a code of ethics. They have a mission statement to follow. They're not doing it. A more than two-year-old law known as the NEAR Act requires D.C. police to better track stop and frisk to protect against racial bias and misconduct by police officers. But our investigation found D.C. police was not following that law. The D.C. Council has now funded a half-million-dollar plan to better monitor stops like this one. The city says that program won't be up and running until next summer. Now, Eric has posted that entire lawsuit and the accusations against the police officer for you to read on the WUSA 9 mobile app. More than a dozen community groups and neighborhood leaders are calling on Mayor Muriel Bowser to release police body cam footage of two controversial confrontations between police and people in the Deanwood community. WUSA 9 reported on both incidents last month as part of our year-long investigation, DC Police Stop and Frisk. 
Investigative reporter Eric Flack has been working on these all day long. And Eric, has the mayor's office responded to the demands for the video? Not so far, Leslie, and we are still waiting. Our team first asked the police department for the body cam video of this incident and another one earlier this month. But that open records request was denied because the police department said the video was part of an ongoing administrative investigation into the two police incidents that has community groups across the city demanding change. In the first incident, cell phone video shows a number of police officers stop and frisking a group of black men on Sheriff Road in the Deanwood community of Northeast D.C. Despite the men's repeated protests, the officers didn't have probable cause for that search. The only weapon officers found was a BB gun. And despite the angry exchange between officers and the men in that group, no charges of any type were filed. When that cell phone video hit social media, tensions between police and people in that neighborhood reached a breaking point and led to an even more violent clash between officers and community members in which a handful of people were arrested. That incident, also captured on cell phone video, showed taunts and aggression on both sides and led to a day of public hearings during which police were called to task by city council members about their tactics. Both police chief Peter Newsham and Mayor Bowser have defended the department, saying that the officer's body-worn camera video shows things the cell phone video does not and puts both incidents in a different light. Now, the ACLU District of Columbia has sent this letter to Mayor Bowser, asking her to release the officer's body cam video from both events, despite the police department's refusal to do so because of that ongoing administrative review. The ACLU demand letter is signed by 17 other community groups who also want the body cam video released. ANC Commissioner Lorenzo Green, who serves that Deanwood community, has also sent his own letter to Mayor Bowser, calling on the city to release the footage. So if the police chief and the mayor believes that there's a different angle with a different story, then they need to show it. You know, there's other cities and people watch the news every day. They turn on CNN, they see other cities release their body camera footage anytime incidents of great interest pop up. But in D.C., we don't have that. We have a lot of talk to that. We have a lot of people who say they are about transparency, but they do not follow up with their actions. Green also told me not releasing that video will only cause tensions to rise in that Deanwood community and continue to rise at a time when police are actually trying to calm things down. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Tonight, more than a dozen community groups are calling on Mayor Muriel Bowser to release police body cam footage of two controversial confrontations between police and people in the Deanwood community. WUSA 9 reported on both incidents last month as part of our year-long investigation, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. Here's investigative reporter Eric Flack. Our team first asked the police department for body cam video from the two incidents earlier this month, but that open records request was denied because the department said that video was part of an ongoing administrative investigation into the confrontations that have community groups across the city demanding change. In the first incident, cell phone video shows a number of police officers stop and frisking a group of black men on Sheriff Road in the Deanwood community of Northeast D.C. Despite the men's repeated protests, the officers didn't have probable cause for that search. The only weapon officers found was a BB gun. And despite the angry exchange between officers and the men in that group, no charges of any type were filed. When that cell phone video hit social media, tensions between police and people in that neighborhood reached a breaking point and led to an even more violent clash between officers and community members in which a handful of people were arrested. That incident, also captured on cell phone video, showed taunts and aggression on both sides and led to a day of public hearings during which police were called to task by city council members about their tactics. Both police chief Peter Newsham and Mayor Bowser have defended the department, saying that the officer's body-worn camera video shows things the cell phone video does not and puts both incidents in a different light. Now, the ACLU District of Columbia has sent this letter to Mayor Bowser, asking her to release the officer's body cam video from both events, despite the police department's refusal to do so because of that ongoing administrative review. The ACLU demand letter now signed by 20 other community groups who also want that body cam video released. ANC Commissioner Lorenzo Green, who serves that Deanwood community, adding his voice with his own letter to the mayor.
not releasing it is causing the tension to continue. And that's the feeling here. They are trying to find a way to tamper down the tension, try to find a way to turn the page, but we're not going back to business as usual. Green telling me tonight we have a lot of people who say they are all about transparency, but they do not follow up with their actions. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. And you can read those letters from the commissioner and the ACLU calling for the release of the body camera video. Eric has them posted on our website and the WUSA 9 mobile app. Tonight, we may be one step closer to finally seeing D.C. police body cam footage from two controversial confrontations with people in Northeast. Those incidents led to accusations that D.C. police officers violated residents' constitutional rights and provoked angry clashes with people in the Deanwood community. Investigative reporter Eric Flack has been tracking the fight for that video as part of his ongoing series, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. The ACLU District of Columbia just received the ruling from the city challenging the police department's decision not to release that body cam footage. All this comes just weeks after the mayor said she would not release the body cam video despite calls from a number of civil rights organizations to do so. What will we see on the other side of these cell phone cameras? It's the question DC police have been unwilling to answer. Now they may be forced to. Is this all about transparency? Absolutely. It's about transparency and it's about making sure that the government doesn't just do whatever it wants. What police did and whether officers acted properly during a June 13th stop and frisk on Sheriff Road in Deanwood and June 25th when frustrated neighbors clashed with equally combative police officers remains unclear. The incidents led to a day of hearings by D.C. Council in which council members questioned and criticized officers' tactics. Police Chief Peter Newsham and Mayor Mariel Bowser have defended officers' actions, saying the body cam video puts both incidents in a different light. But as recently as two weeks ago, the mayor had refused to override the police department's refusal to release that body cam footage to WUSA 9 because it was part of an ongoing investigation. This despite a letter from the ACLU District of Columbia and 21 other community groups who also asked the mayor to release the body cam footage. Those requests arguing the significant public interest in the Deanwood incidents gives the mayor the right to overrule the police and release the video. But in an apparent about face, the mayor's office of legal counsel has now sided with an appeal filed by the ACLU DC. Ruling in effect, the police department had to prove that releasing the video would interfere with the fairness of legal proceedings related to the incidents themselves, and that DC police had failed to do that, giving the police department five days to either produce the body cam footage or give a better explanation as to why it won't. If everything is okay about what they did, then why shouldn't they want to release this video to allay those concerns? You think it raises more questions that they won't release the video than if they just put it out there? Yes, the fact that they haven't released the video, the fact that they refuse to do so, indicates that the statements from MPD that they're all about transparency, well, they're simply not true. To put all this into context, D.C. police have released body-worn camera video of officer-involved shootings within weeks of those incidents, most recently Terrence Sterling. It has now been about two months since these clashes in Deanwood. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Now we've asked both the police department and the mayor's office for comment on this latest development, but we have yet to get a response. You can find all of the coverage that we've done on this story and our ongoing series DC Police Stop and Frisk on our website and the WUSA 9 News app. It's a story we broke first on the WUSA 9 mobile app. The DC Police Department is trying to fire an officer at the center of a controversial stop and frisk we first brought to light back in February. And now that officer has asked for an appeal hearing to try and keep his job. Investigative reporter Eric Flack is here with the latest in his ongoing series, DC Stop and Frisk. And Eric, we need to tell people some of the language in your report is graphic. That's right, Leslie. It was a stop and frisk in Southwest DC captured on cell phone video that led to a lawsuit against officer Sean Logicano. We now know Logicano might not be a police officer much longer. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him, he alright? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my gut, man. Don't do that, man. Nah, he don't got nothing. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him. 
In the video taken September of 2017, M.B. Cottingham can be seen repeatedly protesting the placement of Officer Sean Logicano's hands as he searches him near Atlantic and First Streets in Southwest. Monday, Cottingham reacting to the news. D.C. police now recommending Logicano be fired for the incident. A relief, yes. Yes, it's a relief. Because, again, he doesn't get to do this to anyone else. And that's the way it should be. You know, you violate, you deal with consequences. We first showed you this cell phone video as part of our ongoing series, DC Police Stop and Frisk, asking Police Chief Peter Newsham point blank if Logicano's actions were appropriate. What I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. Newsham wouldn't answer the question until the D.C. Council forced him to address the issue during hearings this summer. It looked like it was an inappropriate touching by the officer. The ACLU District of Columbia thought so too. After we showed them the video, the ACLU sued Logicano on Cottingham's behalf. The lawsuit accusing the officer of repeatedly jamming one or more fingers into his anal cavity and grabbing his genitalia without a warrant, probable cause, reasonable suspicion or consent. In court filings, Officer Logicano denied touching Cottingham inappropriately or violating his civil rights. In the incident report from that day, Logicano says he got out of his cruiser after spotting an open container of alcohol and that Cottingham consented to a search after he found a small legal amount of marijuana in his sock. Cottingham's attorney saying the department's decision to fire Logicano proves the kind of search the officer did on his client was just wrong. When an officer grabs a person in his most private areas as part of what should have been a routine frisk, that's, that's just wrong. And I think we can all understand that. And, and today, MPD shows that even MPD, which, uh, which has tolerated this kind of behavior for far too long, understands it as well. All right, Eric, so you're telling me now this is not over yet. It's so. not over yet. So the, the hearing, the appeal hearing is called an adverse action hearing. It's all part of the process when a police officer is terminated. That hearing is something most officers will take advantage of. It is scheduled for Friday, but it could be pushed back. In the meantime, Officer Logicano has been transferred to non-contact duty in the second district, which is northwest near us. Um, he's uh, back on administrative, no contact with the public. We've reached out a number of times to his attorney to try and get more of his side of the story, uh, but we have not heard back. And still a lot more follow-ups to come. Yeah, more to come on that. All right, Eric, thanks. In all kinds of incidents, body-worn cameras can bring transparency to the way police interact with the public. If someone complains about the way an officer treated them, the body-worn camera is there to show everyone what really happened. Tonight, a WUSA 9 investigation uncovers body-worn camera video critical to a major civil rights lawsuit against a D.C. police officer has been erased. It's the latest development in our series, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk, and here's investigative reporter Eric Black. When D.C. police officer Sean Logicano performed this search on M.B. Cottingham last September, it was this cell phone video that sent shockwaves through the D.C. community. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold oh, on. He's got nothing on Hey, he don't got nothing on him, he all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my cat, man. Officer Logicano was searching Cottingham for illegal drugs he never found, a search the ACLU District of Columbia now says was unconstitutional in a lawsuit filed after we brought the video to light in our ongoing series, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. It accuses the officer of repeatedly jamming one or more fingers into Mr. Cottingham's anal cavity and grabbing his genitalia without a warrant, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, or consent. He was wrong. He violated. Logicano, who is fighting the department's efforts to fire him because of the incident, has denied touching or searching Cottingham inappropriately, arguing he got out of his cruiser after spotting an open container of alcohol and that Cottingham consented to a search after the officer found a small legal amount of marijuana in his sock. Problem is, the cell phone video doesn't show any of that, but Officer Logicano's body-worn camera footage might. Would you want that other camera angle, would you want that body-worn camera? Yes, I would love to see that video because it tells more of the story. So we asked for the footage under the Freedom of Information Act, 
and were surprised when D.C. police sent us this response, telling us the recording had been purged by the department. In a case that sparked outrage and forced D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsham to answer tough questions about his officers' conduct. I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. Why wouldn't the department have kept the body cam footage that could have exonerated its own officer? Get this, in D.C., body-worn camera recordings only have to be kept for 90 days unless it's evidence in a criminal or internal investigation. Now, there's no criminal investigation here since Officer Logicano never ended up finding anything illegal on Cottingham. But how about an internal investigation? According to D.C. Police's own posted guidelines, body-worn camera recordings of incidents that result in internal investigations should be kept Five years, and D.C. police told us there was an internal affairs investigation into Logicano, one that led to his dismissal. Which begs the question, why wasn't that video kept? Harlan Yu runs a D.C. nonprofit that studies body cam policies and when police should and shouldn't be keeping that video. I think if somebody at the department knew about it, they should have at least flagged that footage. Cottingham says the department did know about it, telling us he complained to commanders at the district the very same day, but felt like he was getting the runaround. And spoke with one guy, sent me to another guy, sent me to another guy, then sent me to another guy that I had to wait for. Cottingham left without filing a formal complaint. D.C. police tells us that the purging of Officer Logicano's body cam video is consistent with MPD policy on records retention and evidence preservation. This, despite what's right there in black and white about that five-year guideline on internal investigations. We checked with dozens of police departments around the country and found most mirror guidelines of the district only keeping that body-worn camera footage for 90 days. But there are some police departments, including Chicago and New York, who keep those recordings much longer than D.C. police. And that was Eric Black reporting right now on the WUSA 9 app. We've got a complete breakdown of how long D.C. police officers keep body-worn camera video and under what circumstances? Now to major developments in our year-long investigation of D.C. police stop and frisk. Glad you're with us here tonight on WSA 9. I'm Adam Longo. The D.C. government has agreed to a big-time payout for a man who claims an MPD officer violated his constitutional rights. Now, this happened during a pat-down that we first showed you back in May. Investigative reporter Eric Flack has been on this story for us and has more on the timing of this settlement and what it might say about that police officer's history. Tonight, D.C. government has agreed to settle a lawsuit against police officer Sean Logicano, filed by M.B. Cottingham, the man in that now infamous cell phone video. The district now agreeing to pay the 39-year-old father of three an undisclosed amount of money after Cottingham sued the police officer for violating his civil rights during this search in September 2017. Does this make it all better? Does it make it all better? No, but it's a start. A start how? It's a start to MPD taking accountability for one of their own and the tactics and methods that they choose to use. As we showed you this summer, Cottingham said he agreed to a light pat down after the officer asked him if he was carrying any weapons, which he was not. What he got was an invasive and unconstitutional body cavity search, according to the lawsuit filed in conjunction with the ACLU District of Columbia. It accuses Officer Logicano of repeatedly jamming one or more fingers into Mr. Cottingham's anal cavity and grabbing his genitalia without a warrant, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, or consent. The case wasn't supposed to go to trial until next year, but ACLU DC legal co-director Scott Michaelman said weeks before the police department would have been required to produce internal documents about Officer Logicano's past history, the city reached out to settle the case. We asked for more than 20 specific incidents, internal investigations into alleged misconduct by this particular officer. We knew he had a history, and if we knew it, they knew it. D.C. police have refused to comment on this case, but as we reported this fall, the department is in the process of firing the officer. 
The ACLU saying the message is clear. Everybody knows what this means. When you pay a significant amount to settle a lawsuit, you move to fire the officer. They recognize they screwed up. Officer Logicano denies wrongdoing. He actually plans to appeal his firing in a hearing later this month. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Now, Cottingham told Eric he just wants to get back to his normal life and maybe use some of that settlement money to get his career kick-started again. They are two of the most controversial words in policing. Stop and frisk. Come on, man. Come on, man. Our year-long data investigation sparking outrage in the nation's capital. And I think that MPD is unwilling and is trying to slow walk the release of this evidence because of reporting like what you all are doing. WUSA 9 breaks down the numbers to uncover huge racial disparities in the people stopped by D.C. police and a department not following a law meant to fix it. But what I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. The fallout from our reporting felt across the district. Lawsuits and an officer losing his badge. He was wrong. He violated me. All of it leading to landmark change as Washington, D.C. adopts a new way to police. Stop and frisk. Do y'all do that to white people? Thanks for joining us for our special report, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. I'm investigative reporter Eric Flack. The relationship between police and the public continues to be a complicated one in our country. And while this investigation started with a database look at who police are stopping and frisking, it led to a bigger conversation about the rights of citizens and the responsibilities of police. This officer, white or black, is that all he's focused on is just you know, looking for suspicious people. And it, does a, being black make you suspicious right. to a police yeah. officer? That I mean, I think that- great question. It was back in August when we first interviewed 12 people chosen at random about their experiences with police. Yeah, where did that come from? what I see. Yeah. I wouldn't just say it if I ain't seen yeah. it. 10 of them told us stories about experiencing or witnessing what they believe to be racial profiling when black people feel they are stopped and questioned by police because of the color of their skin. And our, our stories all probably sound alike, you know, or similar. And if they're similar, then they have to be true. The truth is, this conversation is more complicated than just numbers, but let's start there. I spent months analyzing this stop and frisk data I got from the DC Police Department. Between 2010 and 2016, DC Police recorded 22,887 stop and frisk incidents. When you dig into those numbers, eight out of every 10 people who were stop and frisk were black. That's an average of seven African Americans stop and frisk in this city every day. Hi, Kelly. Kelly O'Meara heads up something called the DC Police Strategic Change Division. According to the department's website, she advises the chief of police and city executives on high profile issues. O'Meara told us around half the people stopped in the data set we looked at were questioned but ultimately released because they were not the person police were looking for. So what we try to emphasize is that every stop should be respectful, should let the person know what's going on. And so a stop is not necessarily an antagonistic incident. But isn't that antagonistic for a police officer to come up to me and start questioning me about where I've been and what I've been doing if in fact I'm guilty of nothing? I don't think it has to be, no. Yeah, I don't know how else we can investigate a crime. This is my license. I'm a pharmacist, right? But I get stopped all the time. And because of that, I have to show this. Alexander Oladell has a doctorate in pharmacy. His fraternity brother, Isaac O'Neill, is finishing med school at Howard. Both told us they had been stopped by police on suspicion of committing crimes they were not guilty of. Oladell told us his experience was particularly troubling. Two white cars, they come up to me and they uh, they put me in handcuffs and I'm over at the dashboard like this. And the whole time I was, I was, I don't know why I did this, but I was literally pleading my case. Oh, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a pharmacist student, I didn't do anything. But that didn't, they didn't really care. Oladell spent 30 minutes in handcuffs before he was eventually released. When he asked police why they stopped him, Oladell says he was told he fit a description. This whole idea of fitting a description is important to this conversation because DC police told me they only stop and frisk someone in response to what's known as a lookout. A lookout is a suspect description given to officers and released to the public after a crime is committed. 
DC police told us since eight out of 10 lookouts are for African-American suspects, it only makes sense that eight out of 10 people stopped by police would be African-American. But we checked DC police's Twitter page and discovered many of those lookouts issued by DC police are extremely vague. Over and over again, we saw descriptions where the only specifics were black males wearing dark clothing, hardly uncommon. This lookout for a black male wearing a black jacket and blue jeans, prompting one Twitter user to respond, great description. I hope the entire male population at Howard University doesn't complicate things. Doesn't that mean that DC police is not really being judicious enough and who they're actually looking for? I don't think that's what the victims of crime would think. Omira also said police typically only approach suspects matching lookout descriptions in the immediate area of a crime, drastically narrowing the number of people who could potentially be stopped and frisked. Oh, hey, my name is Eric Flyer. Nice yeah, to meet you. Him. So have you been stopped by police unnecessarily? I've been stopped by police more times than I can count. The last time it happened to Paul Butler, he says he was walking in his northwest D.C. neighborhood. And all of a sudden, I see a police car roll up, uh, roll down their windows. What are you doing here? I'm walking home, officer. Do you live here? Well, officer, do I have to live here in order to walk on the streets? Butler told us he believes police thought he was a burglar or homeless. He is actually a professor at Georgetown Law and the author of the book, Chokehold, Policing Black Men. They just couldn't accept that I could actually live in this nice neighborhood. And the, here's the punchline. These four officers were all African-American. In fact, DC police tell us more than half the department, 52%, is African-American. We're not talking about this enough. Why hasn't it gotten better? Good question, and one we wanted to put to DC's top cop, Police Chief Peter Newsham. We spent four months trying to sit down with the chief, formally requesting an interview with him more than a dozen times. We sent emails and texts. We made phone calls. I even met face-to-face -face with his staff here at police headquarters. But time and time again, our requests were put off, ignored, or flatly denied. It left us no other choice but to track the police chief down out on the street during last month's MLK celebration. Chief Newsham, hey, my name is Eric Flack. I'm a reporter from WUSA 9. Hi, Eric. Newsham told us he was unaware of all those interview requests we put in with his office. So you're asking me, you're essentially jumping me out here trying to get me to say something that's that's you know inappropriate when I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I never wanted to have this conversation out here. I've been trying for months to have well, it in we'll a proper up, way. Then. Let's set it up. But when we tried to finally set up that interview, DC police told us we wouldn't be allowed to speak with Chief Newsham after all. So who do they want us to talk to instead? A captain? A lieutenant? Nope. They told us we had to talk about stop and frisk with a person who has never stopped or frisked anyone a career administrator who has never been a police officer. Remember Kelly O'Mara? Does the chief have more experience talking about that sort of stuff? The chief certainly has more experience actually doing the stops. O'Mara did tell us that part of her civilian role with the department is to help shape stop and frisk policy. And when it comes to the data we studied, the most important thing to consider is not how many black people were stop and frisked, but how they were treated. One, I would hope, I would ask them, was it done in a respectful manner? You know, we appreciate you're taking the time to work with us. We're trying to protect the city. So how many of those stop and frisks are happening in your neighborhood? Well, we have a new interactive way for you to find out. Our data guy, Jordan Fisher, is here. He has created a map that you can search for yourself to find out how many of these stop and frisks are happening in your neighborhood. Jordan, show us how it works. What we're seeing right now is a map of the hot spots the places where the most stop and frisk incidents occurred in 2017. Red, as you can imagine, means more. Yellow means less. We've got a couple different ways that you can look at this. Right now I have our neighborhood layer up, so you can click see your specific neighborhood and how many incidents it had that. But you can also wow. view it by police district. Very cool. Or, Eric, if you'll zoom us out, take a look at hot spots throughout the area. And as you zoom into the map, you're going to get an even more refined view of that data. So we're going block by block, street by street here, right? Block by block, street by street. There's one specific address we're going to be looking at later in the show, 5200 Sheriff Road. Can you show us what's going on there? Absolutely. Let's take a look. You can see right here, right at 5200 Sheriff Road, nine incidents last year. Just south of there, 
18 stop and frisk incidents for a total of 27 within about a half mile area. In a one year period, and that's a lot. That is a lot. We actually have that new interactive map on our WUSA 9 mobile app and website right now so you can see what's going on on your block for yourself. So we took our stop and frisk data analysis and we kept asking questions and our reporting led to a stunning revelation. We found the DC Police Department was not following a two-year-old law created to better track stops done by its officers. As a result of our reporting, the DC Police Chief speaking words he likely never thought he would. His department was guilty. The thing that I think we have to say is unacceptable is to say we're just going to not do those things because we don't want to do it. I, I agree with that, sir. I 100% I agree that it's not acceptable. DC's top cop under fire Thursday. Police Chief Peter Newsham grilled by DC Council Member Charles Allen about the department's failure to collect comprehensive stop and frisk data, which is required by law. As for Chief Newsham, for the first time, publicly taking the blame. To the extent there has been a delay in this data piece and not a, a complete understanding of the, uh, the necessary infrastructure changes that would be required, uh, we're guilty. Right now, D.C. police only log basic information in their stop and frisk reports, like the date, age, race, and location of the stop. But in 2016, D.C. Council required the police department to do a lot more by passing the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results, or NEAR Act. The NEAR Act requires police to record more than two dozen additional fields of information, including the violation that led to the stop, if a search was conducted, the reason for that search, and whether an arrest was made because of the stop or search. But two years later, Chief Newsham admits that still isn't being done the way the law requires, saying his department didn't fully understand what it would take to implement the stop and frisk data collection when it told D.C. Council it would only need $150,000 to make the necessary changes. Why were we wrong when we said $150,000? And then the second part of the question is, um, when did, we when did we determine that that was not going to be sufficient to yeah, be able I think, to I think uh, we're probably a little bit guilty on the second question of uh, prioritizing. Prioritizing by implementing other provisions of the NEAR Act first, like collecting data on felony arrest and use of force before the department figured out how to do that comprehensive stop and frisk data collection, which they say is a much more complicated task. But our reporting revealed improving stop and frisk data collection in the district should have been a priority. Black Lives Matter DC core organizer April Goggins believes the timing of DC police's surprising admission that not only were they not collecting the wider stop and frisk data, but also that the department had no solid plan to do so is not a coincidence. I think they're backtracking and it, I, I, honestly, I think it was your reporting and community, um, community pressure that got them to finally admit that they didn't have it. The problem is where do we go from here? I think they've got to be honest about um, what they need. So what does D.C. police need to get this done? No one seems to know. Not even Deputy Mayor Kevin Donahue, who has oversight over the D.C. Police Department. So standing right here right now, you still don't know how much it's going to cost or how long it's going to take. I know it's going to cost more than what was set aside in the budget. How much more? That answer is still ahead. But first, a man who says he can show you why our city needs to police stop and frisk better. What we didn't want to get lost in our DC police stop and frisk series are the people impacted most by the department's failure to follow the city's stop and frisk reporting law. And as you're about to see, it's easy to understand why this matters so much to some neighborhoods. It seems like there is this big, beautiful, gentrified Washington, D.C. out there, mm -hmm. but then there's still this part of the city that has a reality that the rest of the city doesn't know about. Doesn't know about. Is that the way it feels sometimes? Yeah, that's why I put my videos out there. Washington, D.C. may not look the same to you as it does through the lens of Suit Visions, a small YouTube page dedicated to videos of D.C. police stopping and frisking people in wards 7 and 8. Those are the last remaining parts of the city made up almost exclusively of African Americans. Suit Visions videos have been viewed tens of thousands of times. 
And while the man behind the camera doesn't want to show you his face, he believes his videos pull back the curtain on police treatment of African Americans. There's no trust with the police officers here in, in War 8 or 7 in major black in communities in D.C. because these are the same officers that are, that are here harassing us and we're supposed to call them when something is wrong. It's not, it's not gonna work. What does the 26 year old consider harassment? Watch what he caught on camera last November. A DC police officer rolls up on him. Hey, how you doing? Everything good? Everything good with y'all? With a question meant for a suspect. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, you don't have any guns. I'll talk on you, right? Nah, I don't got no guns. Y'all got the guns. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What was I said, y'all have the guns. I do, but I want to make you don't have any either. He did not have any guns. All right, I appreciate it. Have a great night, man. We got to do that to white people? Now we're going to show you a second video, and this one demonstrates just how fine the line can be between a justifiable and non-justifiable search and why it's so important to record as much information as possible about stop and frisk. Police spotted this man drinking in public and with a closer look saw he had small bags of pot in his sock. Now the pot was within the legal limits in DC, so the man told police they could frisk him. What you might not know is that there are two types of searches police can do. They can frisk somebody for weapons, which is a light pat down on the outside of the clothing, like what would happen at TSA, or they can search somebody for drugs. Now that search can be much more invasive, but police cannot do the more handsy drug search without probable cause of a crime. And police don't appear to have that here. Now remember, the man did tell police they could search him, but for what, weapons or drugs? The man never specified because the officer never said what he was looking for. And if you watch the man's reaction closely, it's clear he does not consent with where that officer is placing his hands. Come on, man. 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 Come on, which means it wouldn't matter what the officer later wrote in this incident report, that he felt what he believed to be contraband hidden in the subject's rear end. The officer eventually discovers that contraband was, quote, underwear, which had bunched together. The man was released and allowed to leave, but not before the officer mocks that cameraman, comparing him to people who post videos to the popular hip hop website, World Star. How y'all doing, World Star? How y'all doing, World Star? Free to read, free to work for. I got all that on camera to too. You going in the middle too. We showed the video to the ACLU District of Columbia, who called it, quote, exactly the type of abusive interaction between DC police and residents that motivated DC Council to pass the NEAR Act data collection requirement. The Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results, or NEAR Act, was created in 2016 to force police to record a lot more details about stop and frisk, to keep DC police in check, to make sure officers aren't unfairly and unconstitutionally profiling African Americans. Americans. But our reporting revealed the D.C. Police Department was not following that two-year-old stop and frisk data collection law. To the extent there has been a delay in this data piece and not a, a complete understanding of the, uh, the necessary infrastructure changes that would be required, uh, we're guilty. Meaning there is no comprehensive data on stops like the ones we showed you to determine whether they were by the book. We gotta do that to white people? Hi, Chief Newsham. Hi, hi, sir. What's your name? Uh, Eric Flack, WUSA. Chief Newsham said he didn't know my name, but he seemed very familiar with our stop and frisk reports. But we can't work with you. I'm sorry. Okay, can you just tell me if this I video think you heard what is I said. inappropriate? I think you heard well, I disagree with everything you said, but what I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. Newsham wouldn't answer that, saying instead he didn't agree with our reporting. Well, Somebody I mean, I think my it. questions are no, fair, and I've not misrepresented anything. You, you have misled the public according to my public information officer, and some of the things you have done have been unethical. I want the police to follow the law. That's it. The man behind those street videos is also still waiting for answers about how police treat the people in his neighborhood. It makes me feel like I'm not even welcome to walk down my own street. 
Despite repeated requests, D.C. police never offered any specifics as to how our stop and frisk series has been misleading. And in fact, we had not heard the last of one of those videos that we exposed. More on the fallout from those controversial images later in our show. But first, the police chief and the mayor sued for the stop and frisk tracking failures we uncovered. The fallout from our reporting was far reaching and included a number of lawsuits, including one against city leaders to force them to finally collect comprehensive stop and frisk data. The lawsuit, which cites WUSA 9's ongoing reporting on the DC Police Department's stop and frisk practices, was filed in DC Superior Court by the ACLU District of Columbia, Black Lives Matter DC, and Stop Police Terror Project DC. It names Mayor Mariel Bowser, Deputy Mayor Kevin Donahue, and Police Chief Peter Newsham as defendants and asks for a court ordered injunction to force the police department to collect comprehensive stop and frisk data. I think it's extremely unfortunate that we had to take this step that they didn't just do what they were supposed to do when the council required it. The council required it more than two years ago by passing the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results or NEAR Act, mandating DC police to greatly increase the amount of data it records about stop and frisk to keep police in check and identify potential racial bias. They are not complying with the law. To have a government agency that doesn't think that they need to comply with the law is deeply troubling. Now it is time to turn it over to a court and have a court enforce them collecting the data in a way that makes them follow the law. So let's break down a timeline for you. The lawsuit comes six weeks after the ACLU sent a letter to D.C. government demanding records and data about stop and frisk by the D.C. Police Department. That demand letter citing WUSA 9's ongoing investigation, which found 83% or 8 out of 10 police stops in the district involved a black person, even though less than half the city's population is African American. And that DC police had failed to follow those stop and frisk data requirements included in the NEAR Act. At a DC council hearing one day after that demand letter was sent, Chief Newsham admitted the department didn't have a system or even a plan in place to start collecting the stop and frisk data. Eugene Perrier of Stop Police Terror Project DC telling me that stop and frisk data is about more than just numbers. These data points are really real everyday people who are being seriously affected by the practices of policing here in the District of Columbia. And it's extremely important that we actually keep this data and keep it the right way. In response to the lawsuit, a spokeswoman for the mayor telling WUSA 9 tonight, we are working with our partners on the council to solidify an investment in collecting data. So what is that investment? Well, days after the lawsuit was filed, the city finally came up with an answer, putting a half million dollar price tag on its plan to collect comprehensive stop and frisk data for the first time. The city council passed the funding unanimously. More on what that new stop and frisk reporting system will look like later in our broadcast. But after the break, the man in that now infamous stop and frisk video tells his story for the first time. Now, as I mentioned earlier in our show, there was a second lawsuit that came out of our reporting. This one accusing a DC Metropolitan Police officer of violating a man's constitutional rights during a stop and frisk. That lawsuit came less than two months after we broadcast cell phone video of the incident. The man in that video breaking his silence to WUSA 9, telling me he felt humiliated and degraded by that police officer. I'm a very important guy in my community. Very important, they love me. I'm, I'm the ice cream man, you know, so. <laughs> MB Cottingham means that literally. He says he drove an ice cream truck for years in Southwest DC when he wasn't trying to get his singing career off the ground. But now he's known best for this video of a stop and frisk from September 27th, 2017. Posted to YouTube, seen more than 52,000 times. Replayed in Cottingham's mind over and over again. Come on, man. 
The 39-year-old father of three talking about it publicly for the first time. He knew that he was violating me. He knew it. He had to. The day wasn't supposed to go this way. It was Cottingham's birthday. He says he stopped to have a drink with a group of friends on a sidewalk of his southwest D.C. neighborhood when a group of police officers rolled by and noticed the open container of alcohol. Officers pulled up, as they normally do in my community, you know. You have any guns on you? No, sir. Everyone almost simultaneously said no at the same time. That's when this officer, identified in the lawsuit as Sean Logicono, spotted a small amount of marijuana in Cottingham's sock. The pot was within the legal limits in the district, so Cottingham says he offered to let Officer Logicono pat him down for weapons. The lawsuit says Cottingham called it doing the hokey pokey because you turn yourself around. But Cottingham did not get the light pat down he expected. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold you stuck your finger in my he don't got nothing on him, he all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my cat, man. Don't do that, man. Nah, he don't got nothing. Come on, man. He don't got nothing on him. I don't have nothing. The lawsuit says Officer Logicono jammed his fingers between Mr. Cottingham's buttocks and grabbed his genitals which could be acceptable if this was a drug search, but since small amounts of pot are legal in D.C., the officer doesn't appear to have probable cause for that more invasive drug search. Yet the officer continues, despite Cottingham's continued protests about where he's putting his hands. He again goes back in after he stopped. Same area that I just told you I was uncomfortable. Now, I don't know what you think you're going to, you're not going to pull a rabbit out of a hat so to speak. The officer did not find any illegal drugs or weapons, and Cottingham was eventually released. D.C. police told us they won't comment on pending litigation, but last week, Police Chief Peter Newsham told D.C. Council after reviewing the video, it looked like it was inappropriate touching by the officer, and that Logicono had been disciplined, but was still on active duty with the police department. The ACLU, which filed the lawsuit on Cottingham's behalf, says that isn't good enough. When off, an officer misbehaves this badly, the consequences should be severe. You think the officer should be fired? I do. I mean, obviously, that's not a decision that's, that's up to me, and that's not something we can ask the court to order. But I think if the chief is serious about policing in a constitutional and respectful manner, the types of actions we saw in that video have no place in the District of Columbia. The officers are supposed to be there to protect and serve. They took a note. They have a code of ethics. They have a mission statement to follow. They're not doing it. As our investigation continued, we discovered there was something else the police department didn't do or keep that was critical to uncovering the truth about what happened that day. That missing piece of evidence, coming up. As we continued to investigate a stop and frisk many in our community called unconstitutional, a stunning revelation, body-worn camera video taken by the officer that day had been erased, and we wanted to know why. When D.C. police officer Sean Logicano performed this search on M.B. Cottingham last September, it was this cell phone video that sent shockwaves through the D.C. community. Come on, man. Come on, man. Oh, Hey, he don't got nothing on him, he all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my cat, man. Don't do that. Officer Logicano was searching Cottingham for illegal drugs he never found, a search the ACLU District of Columbia now says was unconstitutional in a lawsuit filed after we brought the video to light in our ongoing series, D.C. Police Stop and Frisk. It accuses the officer of repeatedly jamming one or more fingers into Mr. Cottingham's anal cavity and grabbing his genitalia without a warrant, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, or consent. He was wrong. He violated me. Logicano, who is fighting the department's efforts to fire him because of the incident, has denied touching or searching Cottingham inappropriately, arguing he got out of his cruiser after spotting an open container of alcohol and that Cottingham consented to a search after the officer found a small legal amount of marijuana in his sock. Problem is, the cell phone video doesn't show any of that, but Officer Logicano's body-worn camera footage might. Would you want that other? camera angle, would you want that body-worn camera? Yes, 
I would love to see that video because it tells more of the story. So we asked for the footage under the Freedom of Information Act and were surprised when D.C. police sent us this response, telling us the recording had been purged by the department. In a case that sparked outrage and forced D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsham to answer tough questions about his officer's conduct. I just want to know is if this is an acceptable way to frisk somebody. Why wouldn't the department have kept the body cam footage that could have exonerated its own officer? Get this, in D.C., body-worn camera recordings only have to be kept for 90 days unless it's evidence in a criminal or internal investigation. Now, there's no criminal investigation here since Officer Logicano never ended up finding anything illegal on Cottingham. But how about an internal investigation? According to D.C. Police's own posted guidelines, body-worn camera recordings of incidents that result in internal investigations should be kept five years, and D.C. police told us there was an internal affairs investigation into Logicano, one that led to his dismissal. Which begs the question, why wasn't that video kept? Harlan Yu runs a D.C. nonprofit that studies body cam policies and when police should and shouldn't be keeping that video. I think if somebody at the department knew about it, they should have at least flagged that footage. Cottingham says the department did know about it, telling us he complained to commanders at the district the very same day, but felt like he was getting the runaround. And spoke with one guy, sent me to another guy, sent me to another guy, then sent me to another guy that I had to wait for. Cottingham left without filing a formal complaint. D.C. police tells us that the purging of Officer Logicano's body cam video is consistent with MPD policy on records retention and evidence preservation. This, despite what's right there in black and white about that five-year guideline on internal investigations. Now, we checked with dozens of police departments and found most mirror the guidelines of the district. But there are some departments that keep body-worn camera footage much longer. In New York, police keep body-worn camera video one year. In Chicago, it's kept five years, regardless of whether it's been flagged as part of an investigation. Still ahead, a surprising conclusion to that lawsuit and the career of the officer at the center of the controversy. But first, tensions between police and the community boil over. As the issue of stop and frisk turned into a citywide conversation, another controversial incident came to light. Remember earlier when we used our new interactive data map to show you all the stop and frisks that happened on Sheriff Road in the Deanwood community? Well, we discovered a cell phone video from that neighborhood that once again forced the department to take a hard look at the way its officers are doing stop and frisk. How's everybody doing? We cool. cool. We just want to rep to whoever owns the Volvo, man, about the tents. That's it all started calm enough. A couple of D.C. police officers approach a group of African-American men sitting on a street corner. They say they're only interested in that Volvo with windows tinted too dark. We're not worried about a little bit of weed or anything, the over container or whatever. That's it, just the tents, man. 30 seconds later, it becomes clear those officers are interested in more than just window tinting. All right, everybody got IDs and stuff like that. What's the call, sir? Backup arrives, and with it, a new question for one of the men standing in the group. Don't show him, bro, don't show him. The officer was asking a man just off camera, that guy right there in the white shirt, to lift his shirt and show his waistband so he could check to see if he had a gun in it otherwise known as a stop and frisk. Something police only have the right to do if the officer reasonably suspects the person is in possession of a weapon and a danger. Our year-long WUSA 9 investigation uncovered eight out of 10 people stop and frisked by DC police are African American and that the department has failed to follow a law passed in 2016 to better track stop and frisk and protect against racial bias, which is what many of the men on this corner thought was happening here. I ain't commit no crime. I ain't consenting no search. But the man in the white shirt does consent to a search, which turns up what appears to be a handgun in his waistband. All right, sir, 
Stand by. Let's, let's calm down, okay? Officers then tell the crowd they are using the discovery of that gun as justification to search everyone else. What's the call, bro? Well, right now we just found one. I don't care. I don't know him. And he's hanging out with y'all. He's not hanging with us. But no one else consented to be frisked over and over again, telling the officers that guy in the white shirt, the one with the apparent gun, was not a part of their group. They saying they think that he was up here hanging with us. We don't even know that guy. As the situation escalates. Go that way, go that way. That man in the white shirt simply walks away and drives off. You need to back up, okay? You need to back up. Let's go back. Late Monday, we found out why. D.C. police telling us that gun they pulled out of the man's waistband wasn't a handgun, it was a BB gun. And although police say they did turn up some PCP and marijuana, no weapons were found during these frisks. Reaction to that cell phone video came quick. Neighborhood leaders calling what happened a complete violation of those men's civil rights. Anger spread like wildfire, the powder keg boiling over the same night we broadcast that video. Our team right there on the front lines. The images were jaw-dropping as dozens of police and angry young men and women clashed in Deanwood. Officers used batons, tasers, and mace to back up the crowd, but the crowd didn't back down their camera phones just inches from officers' faces. Four people were arrested in the melee, the entire scene leaving community leaders in disbelief. I'm sad by this. Sad. This is the response. This is response for folks speaking out for our people. This is the response. But I'm not afraid of them. They're not afraid of them, you know, and we're going to we're going to stand vigilant and we're going to push back hard and we're going to keep talking out. We're going to keep talking and we're going to keep posting those videos and, you know, and we're going to keep revealing the truth to our people and hope they wake up and realize that when your people speak, you need to listen to them. The troubling incidents and images prompted D.C. Council to hold public hearings demanding the department and the police chief repair its relationship with that community. Coming up, the city pays up and the police department owns up for the actions of one of its officers. As pressure from the community and D.C. Council mounted on police to make changes, we learned one member of the department would be losing his badge. Police told us they were firing Officer Sean Logicano for that intrusive and potentially unconstitutional search of a man in southwest D.C. But that was not the only shoe to drop. The D.C. government agreed to a big-time payout to the man in that video. The timing of the settlement potentially speaking volumes about that police officer's history. DC government has agreed to settle a lawsuit against police officer Sean Logicano, filed by MB Cottingham, the man in that now infamous cell phone video. The district now agreeing to pay the 39 year old father of three an undisclosed amount of money after Cottingham sued the police officer for violating his civil rights during this search in September 2017. Does this make it all better? Does it make it all better? No, but it's a start. A start how? It's a start to MPD taking accountability for one of their own and the tactics and methods that they choose to use. As we showed you this summer, Cottingham said he agreed to a light pat down after the officer asked him if he was carrying any weapons, which he was not. What he got was an invasive and unconstitutional body cavity search, according to the lawsuit filed in conjunction with the ACLU District of Columbia. It accuses Officer Logicano of repeatedly jamming one or more fingers into Mr. Cottingham's anal cavity and grabbing his genitalia without a warrant, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, or consent. The case wasn't supposed to go to trial until next year, but ACLU DC legal co-director Scott Michaelman said weeks before the police department would have been required to produce internal documents about Officer Logicano's past history, the city reached out to settle the case. We asked for more than 20 
specific incidents, internal investigations into alleged misconduct by this particular officer, we knew he had a history. And if we knew it, they knew it. D.C. police have refused to comment on this case. But as we reported this fall, the department is in the process of firing the officer. The ACLU saying the message is clear. Everybody knows what this means. When you pay a significant amount to settle a lawsuit, you move to fire the officer. They recognize they screwed up. Officer Logicano denies wrongdoing and has appealed his firing. So after more than two years of inaction, our reporting forced D.C. police to finally follow that law requiring it to better track stop and frisk. But what will the impact be on you and officers? We traveled hundreds of miles to get that answer to New York City, home to eight and a half million people, 36,000 officers, and a new way to police stop and frisk. The debate about stop and frisk here in New York City goes back nearly two decades and involves lawsuits, landmark court rulings, and now the most comprehensive stop and frisk reporting system the city has ever seen. I grabbed a camera and a subway card to find out how it's working. First stop, One Police Plaza, AKA NYPD headquarters. So what has it been like here in, in, in New York City and the New York City Police Department to collect all that data? It's a, it's a tremendous effort. Nancy Hoppock is the Assistant Deputy Commissioner for NYPD. She oversees the department's monitoring of stop and frisk. It's a tracking system that was overhauled back in 2015 after a lawsuit brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. We headed across town to speak with the man who was lead counsel on that lawsuit, senior attorney Darius Charney, who challenged the system with almost the same racial disparities our WUSA 9 investigation uncovered back in the district. When eight out of 10 stop and frisks in Washington, D.C. are done on African-Americans, when they don't nearly make up that percentage of the population, is that concerning? Absolutely. I mean, that's the same exact disproportionality we had in New York, which is what led to our case, which is what led to all of the court rulings and all the changes around stop and frisk. Those changes forced NYPD officers to fill out this comprehensive reporting form every time they stop and frisk someone. A very similar data set, D.C. police is now required to collect under the NEAR Act. But D.C. police admits it has failed to follow that two-year-old law, continuing to document only limited data about stop and frisk. When you were only collecting age, race, date of a stop, location. What are we missing there? We're missing whether or not the stop was legal. In other words, why did the officer make the stop? The stop and frisk data here in New York City is giving the public a never before seen window into the stops made by NYPD officers. So how many of them are justified? Well, just like everything else with this conversation, that's a complicated question. This audit released last December found reasonable suspicion in 71% of NYPD's 2017 stops. But what does that mean about all the rest? Is it fair to say then that 30% were not justified? No, and that's the limitation of using paper. Hoppock told us that while some of those stops were found to be unjustified by supervisors who reviewed them, others were simply not articulated by officers correctly, meaning they were justified, just not recorded in a way that demonstrated why. Despite its shortcomings, Hoppock calls the new stop and frisk reporting the system NYPD needs. You're going to get no argument from the NYPD that it is important to collect data about our enforcement activity and to share that data with the people we police. That's important for our trust. It's important for our transparency. Still, Hoppock says that transparency comes at a price. We do worry about, you know, an officer on patrol today, a lot is expected of her, a lot. Giving her too much paperwork to do, we worry about that. We want to find that sweet spot of tracking the data, collecting the data points, but not overburdening the officer. Even Charney admits this is all a work in progress. While the number of police stops in New York is way down, huge racial disparities remain among those who are stopped by NYPD. When you have that kind of disproportionality, I think it needs to be looked at. And then we need to really go deeper and see, well, OK, why are all these black men uh, and, and women being stopped? Meaning NYPD's new stop and frisk reporting system, just the first step in a very long road, a journey just now getting started back in Washington, D.C. 
NYPD also told me they want people to keep in mind that stop and frisk is a performance metric, but it's only one metric and that successes like low crime rates and police outreach also need to be considered. Here in the district, we will begin to measure DC police on our expanded stop and frisk reporting process next summer. That's when the department says the new system will finally be up and running and we will be watching. We first showed you this shocking video in our year long series DC police stop and frisk tonight. We've got new details in the case that DC police officer caught on a cell phone camera performing what appears to be an illegal stop and frisk is now accused by the police department of a second inappropriate search on the very same day tonight. Investigative reporter Eric Flack brings the exclusive new revelations from outside the hearing where that officer is fighting to keep his badge. Prosecutors from the Attorney General's office say the two body searches by DC police officer Sean Logicono are eerily similar. The first caught on cell phone video went viral. The second never reported until now may cost Logicono his job. Just want to know why you think you should remain a DC police officer. I have no comment. DC Metropolitan Police Officer Sean Logicono facing tough questions Thursday as he appeals the department's decision to fire him for improper searches on DC residents. Do you feel like the actions that were seen on that video were just? <clears throat> Again, I have no comment. I'm about to go into my hearing, so everything that needs to be said will be said in there. WUSA 9 first showed you this video a year ago as part of our ongoing investigation, DC police stop and frisk. As we reported back then, that man, MB Cottingham, agreed to a light pat down after Officer Logicono asked him if he was carrying a weapon, which he was not. The officer can be seen aggressively and intrusively searching Cottingham, despite the man's repeated protests about where Logicono was putting his hands. Officer Logicono also did not have probable cause for that search, according to a review done by his district commanders. The city paid a six figure settlement to Cottingham after he sued over the incident. And last September, DC police told us they were moving to fire Logicono. But today we learned technically Logicono wasn't fired for the search on Cottingham. He's being fired for a second search on a different man that happened less than 30 minutes after this one. Cameras aren't allowed in the hearing room where Officer Logicono is appealing his firing, but I was in there just feet from Logicono when the body worn camera video of that second incident was played. In that video, Officer Logicono is seen running his hands between the suspect's buttocks and along his genitals. The man can be heard on that video telling bystanders Officer Logicono violated me as a man. The search, which happened at the corner of Brandywine and First Street Southeast, resulted in the arrest of the suspect for having an open container of alcohol in the car. But the internal affairs investigator testified Logicono's intrusive search at the scene was, quote, not in the scope of a field search and that even after an arrest, a search like the one on that body cam video would have been done later in a private area and not by Officer Logicono. It was early 2018 when Logicono was disciplined for that first search, the one on the cell phone video, and as punishment, he was taken out of MPD's gun recovery unit and placed back at the district level. But in a bizarre twist, a few months after he was disciplined, Logicono's father, Chris, a retired DC police commander and former deputy chief of internal affairs, asked current internal affairs assistant chief Alfredo Manlapaz to review his son's case in hopes of getting him placed back in the gun recovery unit. Manlapaz went to pull the body worn camera video of the Cottingham incident to look into it further. But instead, he stumbled upon the video of that second previously undiscovered search. Prosecutors say despite Manlapaz's ties to the Logicono family, he quote, felt duty bound to open an investigation. After Internal Affairs investigated that second incident, the department moved to strip officer Sean Logicono of his badge. Do you have anything that you would like to say in your own defense, in your own standing? Uh, I'm gonna say it on the stand. Um, again, I, I have no comment right now, but I, I appreciate it. 
So what did Officer Lo Giacono say inside that hearing room today? Well, he never ended up testifying, but his defense team is making the case that the searches Officer Lo Giacono was disciplined for are no different than any other searches done by MPD officers. Quote, if MPD is truly concerned about what happened, the attorney said, then MPD is going to have to overhaul the entire Narcotics and Special Investigations Division because this is what they do. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. That hearing board has about two months to decide whether it will reverse the decision to fire Officer Logicono. In the meantime, he'll remain on the city's payroll. A DC police training supervisor was asked what rules an officer broke during a suspect search that led to his firing. And his response was, quote, I don't even know where to begin. Now that incident isn't the first time Officer Sean Logicano has faced these accusations. You might remember he's the officer at the center of this viral video. He's fighting to keep his job and he says the alleged intrusive searches he's been seen performing twice are business as usual for DC police. Investigative reporter Eric Flack is back with our special report. Stop and frisk. How are you feeling going into day two? Feeling good. Officer Sean Lo Giacono entered the second day of his appeal hearing with his career hanging in the balance. WUSA 9 first learned of Officer Lo Giacono when we broadcast this viral cell phone video of an intrusive search he did on MB Cottingham on September 27, 2017. A search Lo Giacono would later be reprimanded for. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold, you stuck your finger. But when body-worn video surfaced of a second search at Brandywine and First Street Southeast, one that happened just a half hour after the Cottingham incident, D.C. police launched a second investigation into Officer Logicono. Prosecutors calling that second search eerily similar to the one seen here. Cameras are barred from the hearing room, but we were allowed to watch as body-worn camera video of the second search was shown. The officer seen running his hands between the suspect's buttocks and genitals in apparent violation of department rules. The department recommending Logicano be stripped of his badge after an internal investigation. That decision coming just months after D.C. government paid out a six-figure settlement to the man from the first stop. Also on the stand Friday, Officer Logicono's partner, Kevin Van Hook, who can be seen on the body cam video from Brandywine and First searching a different person during the incident, his hands also seen in the suspect's groin area. But Van Hook was not investigated or disciplined for his actions. Supervisors who reviewed both officers' actions said the circumstances were different, which is why Van Hook didn't face any corrective action. But Logicono's attorney argues the officer is being singled out for tactics that are common across the D.C. Police Department. Meanwhile, prosecutors called a string of D.C. police training supervisors, and they all said the same thing. The Logicano search was well outside the rules and regulations of the D.C. Police Department. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. So Officer Logicano did not get an opportunity to testify today. He'll get that chance when the hearing resumes. The hearing panel only needs to find a preponderance of evidence to uphold his firing. They do not need to find that the searches were improper beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll be following this for you next week. Up first tonight, a stunning turn in our year-long investigation. D.C. Police stop and frisk. Good evening, I'm Leslie Foster. The veteran officer caught on camera performing an invasive search told his side of the story in his fight to keep his badge. Officer Sean Logicano says he knows body searches like this one conflict with the rules and regulations of the D.C. Police Department, but he told the review board veteran officers told him to ignore his training. Here's investigative reporter Eric Flack. For days now, D.C. police officer Sean Logicono has shown up here in hopes of convincing an appeals board to overturn his firing. His words about to turn this proceeding upside down. Officer, what will your message be to the hearing? Um, like I told you, I think the first day we spoke, I'm going to say everything I have to say in there. Inside the hearing room in Petworth, which is closed to cameras, Logicono told the panel of police leaders he was, quote, being thrown to the wolves because of the way I was trained. Logicono admitted two searches on September 17, 2017, violated his training at the police academy and the general orders of the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. But as a young rookie, Logicono said veteran officers told him to, quote, Forget everything you've learned at the academy. That's not how it's done. 
Logicono testified veteran officers in District 4 and the department's Narcotics and Special Investigation Division taught him to closely and thoroughly inspect the groin and crotch area of a suspect even when that person has not been placed under arrest because that's where criminals typically hide guns and drugs. Prosecutors called the two searches in question in this case eerily similar. Come on, man. 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 He don't got nothing on him. He all right? Yeah, don't do that. He don't got nothing on him. He stuck his finger in my neck, man. Don't do that. The first, captured on cell phone video, resulted in a lawsuit and six-figure settlement by D.C. government to the man being searched. The second, caught on body-worn camera video and not publicly available, focused on the groin and crotch area of another suspect. Over his repeated protests, Logicono was violating his manhood. Logicono testified he's performed hundreds of searches just like the one he's being reprimanded and potentially fired for and that many of those subjects also complained about the placement of his hands. Logicono said he was taught by veteran officers that was just the tactic to keep him from finding contraband hidden in the groin area, and that aggressively working that area in a search was the only way to ensure a subject wasn't hiding contraband, even if they had not yet been placed under arrest. Logicono's defense argued the department's decision to fire him was a knee-jerk reaction to the public outrage over that viral cell phone video we first showed you a year ago. The attorney telling the panel they understand the department's position, but Logicono should not be the fall guy. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Now, we did reach out to MPD for comment on the things that Officer Logicono said at the hearing today about training. We're waiting to hear back. We've got some additional coverage, though, from today's hearing right now on our website, WUSA9.com. And you can read why some of Logicono's former commanders say he should not be fired, even if his searches are found to be improper. We begin at five with breaking developments in our year long series. DC police stop and frisk. Investigative reporter Eric Flack broke the news first on his Twitter page. A DC police hearing board has upheld the firing of one of its own, Sean Logicano, for improper and intrusive body searches on DC residents. You may remember this video that we showed you back in early 2018. Logicano was ultimately fired for a similar search on another man. He appealed that decision to a three person hearing board in March arguing those tactics were common practice throughout the D.C. Police Department, even though searches like that one violated department rules and officer training. Today, a source within the police department told us that appeal was denied. We'll have more on this developing story tonight at 11. Intrusive body searches and explosive video. There are major developments tonight in our year long series. DC police stop and frisk. Good evening. I'm Leslie Foster. Sean Logicano has been fighting to keep his job as a DC police officer. Today we learned DC police are inhabited. You may remember this video we first showed you last year. Investigative reporter Eric Flack has been all over this story since the beginning. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hold. Hold. The fallout from this cell phone video, which we first showed you back in February 2018, continued Wednesday with a source telling WUSA 9 a D.C. Metropolitan Police Department hearing board has upheld the firing of Sean Logicono. Although Logicono was disciplined for this search, the department ultimately moved to fire him for a second similar search caught on body worn camera video, but not publicly available. That search like the first, focused on the groin and crotch area, even though neither man was placed under arrest at the time, which is policy. We questioned Logicono about that search back in March. Do you feel like the actions that were seen on that video were just? <clears throat> Again, I have no comment. I'm about to go into my hearing, so everything that needs to be said will be said in there. What Logicono said in that closed appeal hearing, almost as explosive as the video itself, testifying that he has performed hundreds of searches just like that one, even though it violated his training at the police academy and the general orders of the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. Logicono said he was taught by veteran officers aggressively working the groin area in a search was the only way to ensure a subject wasn't hiding contraband, even when they had not yet been placed under arrest, adding that as a young rookie, those veteran officers told him to, quote, forget everything you learned at the academy. That's not how it's done. Just want to know why you think you should remain a D.C. police officer. I have no comment. But tonight, Logicono is commenting, telling me by text message he is, quote, 
grateful for the opportunity to have worked with so many great people at MPD. We've got more on the Logicono case and our Stop and Frisk series on our WUSA 9 website.